they're taking over and they they put it they put all some pictures that I had up in the cloud and I don't know how to get them back. Oh, they, oh, okay. Um, we can get you help with that. We've got some pretty good tech people. Okay, I'm going to jump in and get us started. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to Encounter Study. Sorry, I just had a little tech glitch, um, hence just a couple of minutes late. For those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, as always, thank you um, for joining us. And again, if you have any questions or comments, I do keep an eye on the comments section, folks both on Zoom and on Facebook Live. And of course, for the Zoom group, great to have you with us. Um, we're, we're missing some people here tonight, but I think we're gonna, as always, I think we're gonna have a great study tonight. I don't know if you've noticed, but we live in a world where it seems like the moral compass of society has just drastically shifted. I just came from a weekend down at uh, uh, in the GTA where we hosted an Earth Summit. And one of the reasons we hosted the Earth Summit is because it's a response to the whole uh, war right now that seems to be going on uh, in the scientific community to try and keep the church out of science, keep it out of our schools, you know, uh, the church out of our schools. And, and, and there's this idea running around that somehow uh, Christians are opposed to science and that, you know, I, to be a Christian, you got to kind of have to turn your brain off. And so we had a response to that, um, you know, because the, the world is just wanting to keep this idea of a creator away from people. And that's kind of like Romans 1. But then also we shifted in terms of our attitudes towards morality. I remember how, you know, back in the day, I don't know if you remember Dear Abby, the Dear Abby articles and how, you know, you know, she she had some really wise counsel for people, whether it was relationships, maybe something personal or what have you. Still uh, but, today. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> absolutely. But if you look at um, her articles, I mean, there was a time when she was, you know, against things like divorce, like that was an absolute no, no. And um, now it's like, again, with Dear Abby, it's like anything goes. Well, divorce if it makes you happy, be whatever gender you want. And, and now we've shifted from being moral to just whatever makes you happy. Uh, and, but we expect that from the world. We expect the world's moral compass to shift. But then they were looking at the church. And, of course, we're always studying the church. Um, and, and there was a cartoon that poked fun at the way some churches are becoming more uh, tolerant of almost anything goes in order to attract followers. And there was this billboard in front of a church. It's a cartoon, remember? Um, and, and, and this billboard in the cartoon read, uh, the light church, 24% fewer commitments, home of the 7.5% tithe, the 15-minute sermon, um, and 45-minute and worship services. And we only have eight commandments. You get to choose which eight. Uh, and we use just three spiritual laws and have a uh, an 800-year millennium, and uh, everything you wanted in a church and less. And really what it's reflecting is what the Barna Group, uh, uh, they did a study into churches, and they are contending that fewer and fewer um, Christians in North America um, are professing to be Christian or more to the point, even understand what it is they believe or why they believe it. And so it would seem, uh, and this is what Barna is raising the concern on, it seems like we're not changing the world. The world is changing us. And tonight we get into Acts chapter 17, and we see that, uh, and we've been seeing over the last couple of weeks, that Paul's been changing the world, impacting the world, and the world has been fighting back. It's been responding. And so tonight, again, uh, we're going to be talking about this big upset, how it is that Christianity and the message of the gospel itself really can turn the world upside down. And Jesus uh, told us what to expect when that happens. So we're going to be looking at that a little bit here tonight. Before we do, again, welcome everybody, those joining us on Facebook Live. Of course, those who are joining us later in the week on YouTube and our, our faithful Zoom group. 
Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into Acts chapter 17 and we'll read the first 15 verses. But let's pray. Well, Father God in heaven, Lord, again tonight, here we are getting into the books, book of Acts, this church on a mission to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ and to invite others to follow Jesus. And so tonight, Lord, we pray and we ask Holy Spirit as we get into the word, we ask in Jesus' name, again, as always, you'd be our teacher, open the word to us, help us to see and to understand what it is in scripture you would have us know and to take away. Thank you for being with us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, please take your Bibles. We are headed into Acts chapter 17. We're going to read verses 1 through 15. And I'm going to ask those of you who are with us tonight, if you'd be willing to grab two verses each and read through the uh, chapter for us up to verse 50. If somebody would be willing to start us off. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where they went where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went, oh, sorry, and Paul went in as was his custom. And on three Sabbath day, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Explaining okay. and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, <clears throat> becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathered them all. <laughs> set all the city in an uproar and attack the house. Uh, the house of Jason. And sought to uh, bring them out <clears throat> to the people. But when they did not uh, find them, they dragged it. Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying, you know, these who <clears throat> have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason okay. has, oh, sorry. And Jason has received them and they are all acting against the decree of Caesar saying that there is another King Jesus. And the people and the, and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily for whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul of Berea, they came to the also and stood up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as if it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus are both still there. And they that conducted brought and they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, both to come to him with all speed, they departed. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Okay, so folks. Thoughts, questions, comments, anything stand out for you in what we read here tonight? I think, well, the, the fact that the Bereans search the scriptures daily. Mm. And they were, they were um, investigating. They, they were, they were querying what, what, um, 
whether what he was preaching was uh, was the truth. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? That Paul was not afraid to go into the synagogue. It was his custom to do so. So he went, when he came back, he went back into the synagogue to be, to be able, it says the word, it says here that he, um, he reasoned with them. And I'm wondering if he was having a bad study or if he was trying to convince them of something. Mm. Folks, what do you think? What do you think he was trying to convince them of? I'm going to touch on this, Sarah. I'm going to come back to that <clears throat> in a little bit. So hold that thought. Um, Brother P is writing, Paul reasoning with his people, the Jews who rejected Christ, and through scripture was proving that Jesus was the Christ. Uh, Paul was a king debater. <laughs> He, he knew he knew how to frame an argument. Absolutely. We are also told that the Jews were moved with envy. So it tells me that they were very envious of what Paul was doing because they themselves could not do it. Paul was moving people. Paul was talking to people about Christ and the Holy Spirit was working on their hearts. And the Jews were envious of that. They didn't want that happening. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Well, they certainly recognized when uh, when the mob and the leaders of, of the mob recognized that the that um that they had turned the world upside down. Mm. <laughs> that is so expressive. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> now, 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 folks. Also, I didn't put this in my notes, and I'm going to do this later. Um, but, but notice that they played the Caesar card again. Do you notice this? They're 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 doing that. That hey, you know, um, they're, they're claiming that there's another king besides Caesar. You notice how they're playing that card? Yeah. What do you think they're playing that card? So that the authorities would side with them because they would be thinking that, oh, somebody's coming to usurp Caesar or the authorities. Yeah. To cause, mm -hmm. to really to cause havoc, to cause trouble yep. and yep. dissension. Yeah. So they knew for an absolute certainty that this, that, that, that in, in all honesty, they, once you played that card, the authorities have to act. Yeah, like it, it it ties their hands, and I, I think that we kind of miss this in the story of Jesus, when the Jews come to Pilate, and they say, "No, this guy is claiming to be a king," and and almost in that instant, you tie Pilate's hands, because his job is to defend Caesar. Mm -hmm. Um, right? I mean, this is, and when you consider Caesar as a king, this is like heresy and blasphemy, and it's treason, all wrapped up into one. And to be a community leader and to have that claim made, you've got to at least investigate it. You have to somewhat investigate it or you could lose your head over it. Um, especially when you're getting the kind of response from people um, that they were in the numbers that they were. But notice that the Jews, as much as they hated the Romans, mm -hmm. had no problems you playing the Caesar card when mm -hmm. it suited them. Mm -hmm. Right. So so when, when you're on the wrong side of God, you will have no problems aligning yourself with the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And then we're going to see this at the end of time that, again, you know, Protestant Christianity is going to join hands with papal Rome and they're not going to have a problem joining forces with secular government, um, because when you're on the wrong side of God, you have no problems using um, the world is your tool. Sure. Because you're in alignment with it. Yeah. Okay. So, folks, um, any other thoughts or, or questions in regards to that?
I like the fact that women of stature, women of class, women of, of um, well, yes, class and stature, similar. I like the fact that they did not hesitate to accept the word of God as God's spirit convicted them. Mm -hmm. And interesting uh, enough, Sarah, that they, they are open to the word of God. Yes. Like the Holy Spirit knows who's ready. Yeah. And and that's why we go back to what we talked about before. And that is don't go where the Holy Spirit's not sending you. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Holy Spirit sends you somewhere, it's because the Holy Spirit's already pep prepping people for the work that he's going to be doing. Yes. And, you know, and that he's already been doing in our community. And so, um, you know, I, I was sharing this with Ottawa East this past Sabbath, and that is, you know, their church is not in that community by accident. God planted that church in that community yeah. to do the work and to partner with him in the work mm -hmm. that he wants them to do. And it's a unique work. Yeah. And it's the same with Cortland Place. It's the same with mm -hmm. Nepean. It's in a particular neighborhood because there's a work the Holy Spirit intends to do there. Mm -hmm. um, so our job is, again, it's about discernment, understanding where the Holy Spirit is, and then aligning with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, in his book, um, Purpose Driven Church, um, Rick Warren basically said, don't create a wave. Do not try to create a wave. Ride the wave God has already created. Mm -hmm. That always stuck, stuck with me. Yeah. And so, um, again, that's why Paul's having such success. Now, imagine if he'd gone to Asia Minor instead of going where the Holy Spirit had sent him. Look at all these people who would have missed out potentially yeah. on the gospel. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Placide, you're, you're right. When, when, when we're not aligned with God, uh, we have no problems aligning with the world and, and lying and cheating and, and, you know, all sorts of mischief. So I, I want to, I wanted to get in, let's just move into, I want to go back to this verse right here. And can somebody read, reread verse two for us, please. As was Paul's custom, he went to the synagogue service, and for three Sabbaths in a row, he used the scriptures to reason with the people. Okay. Now, we've talked about this a little bit before, but let's just kind of review this. Again, why was it Paul's custom to go to the Jews first? He was biased towards Jews. He hated the Greeks. He only preached on Sabbaths. The Jews had been waiting for the Messiah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I like number D because some Jews accepted the Messiah. Okay. How about some others? I see the kind of processing through this. Yes, it, it's prophesied to go to the Jews first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <you> know, <so. laughs> yeah, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> F folks it is the jews have been waiting on the messiah and i'm going to make a connection to this in a moment but he's going to the very people who first were waiting for the messiah uh mm -hmm. you know these are the people who've been waiting they're preaching about it they're talking about it and they need to hear first um i mean this is the most receptive audience you've been waiting for the messiah well, let's go talk to the people and tell them, Messiah has come. Let me lay it out for you. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of this is Paul's heart is for those people who were like himself. Mm -hmm. These are people who've been waiting for this and you need to hear. Th this is why this is good news. In mm -hmm. part, the arrival of Jesus is good news because mm -hmm. it's like we've been waiting for him. Mm -hmm. and, and folks, at the end of time. When Christ finally comes, we'll be singing a song like, behold, this is our Lord, and we've been waiting for him. Mm -hmm. Right? And they had been waiting for this event, and somebody needed to tell them, you don't need to wait any longer. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back to this thought here in, in a moment. So Paul's talking to them, and he's taking them through um, the Bible prophecies. And I just wanted to ask which Bible prophecies do you think Paul used in his preaching? And by the way, out of all those prophecies concerning Christ and his first arrival, what would be your favorite? 
Okay, um, brother. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I say a fifty-three is a popular one. Yes, brother P. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Psalm twenty-two. Okay. What other ones do you think? You know, it's it's interesting. We know they're there, and and we've never actually. I don't I don't know if I've recalled anybody doing an actual study of the Bible prophecies and aligning them to make the case that Jesus is the Messiah. See, you and I come to it, and we accept that Jesus is God, and and based mostly on the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm wondering what it would be like, and I'm going to think about this. If we as a church sat down and we outlined the prophecies and said, okay, do they real, does Jesus really align with all of these prophecies? And now, again, my favorite would happen to be, I, I actually really like Isaiah 53 and Psalms 22, uh, both for different reasons, but they're great prophecies. But folks, there's 574 verses that refer to the Messiah. And 322 of those are actually prophecies that refer to the Messiah. Um, so, yes, um, uh, Placida, I am sure that Moses and the serpent would have been one of them. Chapter yeah, um, uh, Psalms, uh, 100, uh, Psalm 16, 8 through 11. Uh, how about God's conversation with Abraham regarding how, like, the nations would want to be blessed the way you're going to be blessed? And, yeah. um, you know, um, and God will provide a lamb. That's prophetic. Yeah. I mean, you know, we read that as a story, mm -hmm. but that's prophetic. How many of us love that story? God will provide the lamb. Yeah. And, and so the Bible is filled with 322 of these prophecies. And, folks, I wanted to ask, could more than one person have actually fulfilled the Messianic prophecies? Could more than one person fulfill the Messianic prophecies? In other words, could anybody else, along with Jesus, have fulfilled these? Only Jesus is the Messiah? Yeah. Only Jesus, that's right. So, so I did share this. I did share this in a sermon uh, a while back. The odds of Jesus alone fulfilling all 322 prophecies are one in 84 with 100 zeros behind it. Um, so, so it's literally a mathematical impossibility. And I shared that, but God is the God of the impossible. Yeah. Uh, this was in my Easter sermon, why, why, why Easter is still relevant and it's still important, because it, it, God is the God of the impossible. And while no human being could have actually fulfilled all 322, Jesus actually did. So if I wonder, the, I, I, some part of me wonders, did Paul, like, he took three Sabbaths, did he walk him through all 322 prophecies and make the connection to Jesus? Can, can, can you imagine scholar. the three? <laughs> yeah, he was a scholar, so you, you never know. Well, I, I, again, he memorized the first, right, five books of the Bible. Yeah. But imagine a 322-verse Bible study. Mm -hmm. Like, wow, that would be astounding. Even if he covered half of that, mm -hmm. or even 25% of that, that would be a huge Bible study. Yeah. And to be honest, I would love to have been a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, I would love to have seen how Paul uh, would have mm -hmm. flushed that out. But now, here's the thing: Why did and I didn't I I didn't put this on the slides, but it occurred to me here while we were talking, and and uh, it triggered for me this question, and that is why did Paul have to explain? that the Messiah, and he uses the words had, the Messiah had to suffer and die. Why did he have to explain that to the Jews? Why was he focused on this idea, Messiah had to suffer and die? Because the Messiah replaced all the other, mm -hmm. um, 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 oh dear, the word totally escapes me now. 
Thank the you. ceremonial laws. Thank you, ceremonial and all those rest of things with the, that, 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 that the Messiah is the only one who, who replaced them when he died on the cross. Jesus had to die on the cross. As I started reading over the Bible again, and I'm reading, you know, all the different sacrificial things that they had to do and what they couldn't do. And if they didn't, what would happen to them and how Aaron's sons would kill because they did not respect what God said. God is a very particular mm -hmm. God, you know. And and um, I'm saying, my father, as I'm reading this again, well, I'm not afraid now. Initially, I used to be afraid when I read the Old Testament. But now I, it's different. And I'm saying, my God, we couldn't do this today. It would have been sheer impossible, you know. So I guess that's why. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? So Sarah's saying uh, to demonstrate um, th that the ceremonial law was done away with because Christ fulfilled um, those laws. Um, Eunice is saying because of their misconception uh, idea that the Messiah was coming as king. Um, I think Brother P is, is, is agreeing with this. He said because the Jews believed that the Messiah would save them from the Romans. They didn't believe that the Messiah would die. They believed he would come and save them from the Romans. They also didn't believe the Messiah was God. They simply believed that he was the son of David, although David calls him Lord in Psalms 110. Wow, that, that's quite the connection. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, so folks, anything, any other reasons why that might be? Okay. The sacrificial system pointed towards Christ, and um, and one had to die for for all their sins, and and each one, each one having been a sinner, needed needed someone to redeem them, and 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 they had killed him, and yet and they didn't realize that they were killing the king, the king. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, and, and so I, and I love these. So we have, first of all, they need to be, they had to be shown that Christ was the fulfillment of the ceremonial law. But with what goes hand in hand with that is how we are actually saved. Mm. I mean, they, 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 they thought Messiah was about, and then I agree, this was huge. This was a mindset that had to be undone. And that was the idea Messiah was coming as a conquering king rather than, you know, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So he had to take them back and make all the connections back to the ceremonial law. He had to take them back to the altar. He had to take them back to how we were saved, the blood on the veil. I, I mean, I, not only did he, would he have to take them through the prophecies, but he'd have to take them through the sanctuary and show them how the sanctuary itself would point to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a huge task. So he actually has to change the way they saw the Messiah. Um, so yes, Eunice, there also there is no remission from sin without paying. So grace is not free. Jesus paid for the sin. So it comes with this, that there was a cost to their sin. So the gospel begins with bad news. And the bad news isn't that you're a slave to Rome. The bad news is you were born spiritually dead and a slave to sin. Yeah. Right? And you're not going to die at the hands of the Romans, though you might. But the greater problem was you were going to die and you were headed for the grave. And, and this, this is the bad news of the gospel. So now he has to bring them the good news. And that is everything was, not a, was about saving us from our sin. And so, folks, he's also having to change the way they see Messiah. Today, I, I talk about how important it is the way we see God. Why would it be important for him to change the way they actually saw the Messiah himself? Re remembering that what we believe leads to how we behave. Right. If I can change the way you think, I can change the. So, what is it about their perception of Messiah that he has to change? If God is a God of war and vengeance, 
then what kind of people would that produce? If your God is a God of war, then what does worship entail? What would worship look like? What would faith, what kind of people would that produce? Absolutely, it produces soldiers, it produces warriors, it produces the people who are violent. Yes. If your if your God is a, 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 a you know, um, you look at many of the cultures around Israel, and and the Bible says they were evil in a way, and we're going to get into evil in a moment, but the Bible says they were evil, and and today I don't know that we have a frame of reference for just how violent and vile and vicious those cultures were. And, and what we don't understand is how much those cultures were the product of the kind of God they worshipped. And so for the Romans, they're, 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 one of their key gods was the god of war. Um, and, and so if your picture of God is a god of wrath and vengeance and war and, and, and slaughter and bloodshed, that begins to reflect itself in the worshipers and how they behave. And, and so now he's got to change the way they see God from being a God of wrath and vengeance and, and, and war to that of, and, and um, Placide, I agree with you that this is a God whose kingdom is not of this world. It's not about war. It's about love. It's about truth, kindness, caring, and compassion. Mm. And one who Folks, gave his life. Absolutely. So I have been uh, like I have worked with with colleagues of mine, and there's a the, a series we do on how do you see God, and we've had people become angry with us. Like I had one lady, uh, there was a lady who walked up and slapped my friend in the face yeah. because she was angry about how dare you tell me God is a God of love. Like, can you imagine wow. slapping somebody because you did not want to hear that God, because she'd been hurt. She wanted a God of vengeance. She wanted a God of wrath. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted a God who, who would strike back. Mm -hmm. And so how we see God mm -hmm. uh, by beholding, you become changed. Change, yeah. Right? So if you're keeping your eye on a warrior messiah, rather than a savior messiah, it does change your worship. It changes how we behave. And so I think in part, that's why we're told that God is spirit and those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. True, yeah. Like how we see God affects how we worship, how we talk about him, how we share him with others. And it will even affect how we go about pro helping people solve problems in their life. And so Paul has to explain to them, the Messiah was not what you thought. I have to change your understanding of the Messiah. So let me take you back to the prophecies. Let me take you back to the sanctuary, because you need to understand who Jesus really is if you're going to truly follow him. I had a young man ask me today, what, what do I need to do? Uh, to become a follower of Jesus, what do I need to do Amen. to be baptized? Amen. And and I said, well, you know, you're on the path, but ultimately you need to understand who Jesus is mm. and what he teaches mm -hmm. and what he values. Because if you're going to follow him, you need to understand what it is he is about. Mm. And and he went, yeah, that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? And so that's what Paul's trying to do for these people. He's trying to change the way they see God. And I think there's a work for us to do as God's church that in part we too need to help some people change their pictures of God. Mm -hmm. Some of my Catholic friends have a pretty harsh picture of God. Some of my Baptist friends are even harsher. Um, and I think that part of it is bringing God's true character of love to the world is very important. So let's let's continue on. Um, Acts 17.5. Could somebody read this for us, please? But the Jews becoming jealous and taking along some evil men from the marketplace 
formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. Okay. Now, I wanted to ask this question. What is evil? Mm -hmm. Inflicting pain and suffering. Evil is a social construct. Uh, it's needed for balance in the universe. Only Satan is evil. A, B, D. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you're saying B? A, B, and D. Okay. A and B? A, B, and D. And okay. Yeah, and D? All, all the evil that is Satan is evil is what he transfers to other people. Well, he's okay. got lots of uh, evil angels with him. So he's yes. Because he's yeah. not the only one. <laughs> okay. So, folks, really, when the Bible, now, there are words in Scripture, and I want you to follow my train of thought here. As I, I had some people upset with me a few years back when I brought this up. In the Bible, you have a word called wickedness mm -hmm. that basically covers all sin. It's just an umbrella that just talks about the practice of sin in general. It's just they're all wicked people. Sin is their practice. Mm -hmm. And then you have things that are considered an abomination where they're an absolute uh, vile, disgusting, like abhorrent, absolutely abhorrent to God. Mm -hmm. And then the Bible describes some things as being evil. And when the Bible uses that word evil, often what it's trying to capture and communicate is the uh, how one human being abuses and mistreats another human being. It's literally defined by how one human being treats another. Mm. And so, and, and, and if you think about what we identify as evil or when we hear something is and we say boy that was evil it often has to do with how one person or one group treated another person or another group mm. so we would consider acts of terror to be evil mm -hmm. we would consider things like murder and rape to be mm -hmm. evil mm -hmm. and so when the bible refers to evil men these are men who have no problems inflicting pain and suffering on other human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, this is what makes Satan evil. He has no problems inflicting pain and suffering mm -hmm. on others. So he's he's all of it. He's wicked. He's sinful. He's evil. He's an abomination. He, he captures it all. But when we hurt another human being with intention mm -hmm. and with delight, mm -hmm. and 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 the Bible goes, you're an evil person. It makes us an evil person, yes. Um, so, so when it talks about like, and one of the issues uh, we have is that we live like right now, we live in Canada. It's one of the safest places in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine evil. We, we, we understand acts of evil, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I've ever seen an entire society where all the members of the society are that kind of person. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't know that we truly have a frame of reference for a, a community where everybody in the community is bent mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on hurting other people in the community. Mm -hmm. um, right. So so one of the reasons why God comes along and says, look, like we got to clear out the land mm -hmm. is because of just how vicious and, mm -hmm. and it even goes down into the children. It's, 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 you take Sodom and Gomorrah and it talks about how the young men had come out. Mm -hmm. These, these are young men who are in training for viciousness and evil and inflicting pain and suffering on other human beings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's hard for us to actually, when people read these stories in the Bible, they, they kind of think an entire city is being punished maybe for the sins of a few, not understanding the whole thing is cancerous mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so imagine even your children are are vicious and take delight in hurting other kids mm -hmm. yeah. and so these so when it talks about the jews finding evil men these are jews who actually know who the bullies are mm -hmm. who the vicious people are who the sadistic mm -hmm. sociopathic people are Mm -hmm. and, and again claiming to be god's people look at who they're aligning themselves with mm -hmm. people who delight inflicting pain and suffering 
And so again, when you get out of alignment with God, um, this you you align yourself with the world and you will align yourself with evil people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, wanting to just move on here. So could somebody read verses six and seven for us? You well, can do it in, with the Bible, if that's okay. Go ahead. When, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. Okay. Now, I thought I heard somebody ask, who's this Jason guy? Um, he's he, <laughs> Okay. Jason is one of the, uh, the, the, the Greeks who feared God and became mm-hmm. converted. Okay. So he's, he's, He's 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 the one who's step he's stepping up, might have been a community leader, and he's going, listen, guys, I'm invested in taking care of you. Mm-hmm. Um, I got you know how it is that the person who led you to Jesus, mm-hmm. you have a special bond with them. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, or or you know, like, you know, um I'll never forget the pastor who baptized me. Mm-hmm. There we develop a connection with with people who brought us to Jesus, people who mentor us spiritually. Mm-hmm. And so Jason is one of these people who um, Paul and, and Silas led him to Jesus. And he's like, you know what? I, I have an affection for you. Uh, I'm going to do what I can to intercede on your behalf. Mm-hmm. Um, my city, my people, uh, let me run interference for you. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to ask, so besides jealousy, can yes. you think of another reason as to why the Jewish leaders were so upset with Paul and Silas leading so many people to Jesus? Because they were leading them away from from the Jewish leaders themselves. Leading them from other authority figures. They were exposing them also. They were exposing them. It's like truth and error coming face to face and truth outshines error. So they were exposing those Jews who did not comply with the law of God. Okay. I like this. Um, I I would also add to this that there are people who love the status quo. There are people who just love it the way it is. I, um, we, 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 because of what we're used to, Mm -hmm. right? We, we like the ceremonial, uh, uh, laws. We like the feasts and the festivals, and we like the cleansing ceremonies, and uh, we like, you know, worshiping, you know, at the temple and the sacrifices, and we just happen to love the status quo. We like things in a certain order. We like certain songs. We like to, um, you know, when we do an evangelistic series and there's a topic, we like to hear the same verses being um, preached, and 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 so there are people who would rather kill a church or a movement than to see anything change. Mm. And I, and, and there's part of that here. Um, I've been, you know, uh, I had one friend, um, a, a person at a, a church I pastored and he was 70 years old. Uh, no, he's in the church for 70 years. And we made some slight modifications to the uh, communion service. And he had, Oh, he was in an uproar that we were going to change communion. And by the time we got through the second time we tried that form of communion, uh, he, he, he came to me and he said, you know what? I've been an Adventist for 70 years. And he said, I have to admit, this is the first time I felt the Holy Spirit at a communion. Mm. And so, Liliana, I agree with you. It's hard to accept you're wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, that the way you've seen God is wrong or the way, or, or maybe you believe something about lifestyle or a habit or how we're supposed to behave. And well, one day you just wake up and you find out what do you mean? We got that wrong. Like mm-hmm. I always believed it to be this way. And now you're, t- so the same man <laughs> actually mm-hmm. got upset with me because I would wear a pink shirt or a blue shirt or a nice <laughs> lavender or a burgundy shirt because Pastor, you're supposed to wear white because it represents purity. And I'm like, so what does the black suit represent? (laughs) (laughs) 
solemnity. <laughs> oh no, he was not happy with me. Uh. But, but, under, but but imagine finding out that that that's actually white's not holy in terms of a white shirt's not holy. You can actually wear other colors. Um, right. But but imagine you think about it though. If you can't wear a different shirt, what else are you going to get stuck on? Mm. And so th there are times I think we forget the humanity of these individuals and that really it can be hard to accept that you're wrong. It's hard to accept that things change or mm. that our understanding of scripture was wrong. Mm. Uh, and then Eunice, I agree with you. Um, also, you know what? There's power and, and money tied to the influence of being a religious leader. Mm -hmm. I mean, they made their money from tithes and offerings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if that shifts now, uh, uh, part of this is uh, about um, sheep stealing. Um, I, I remember we were um, a, a growing church in another community. And people were making a shift from one church over to ours because they were discovering the Sabbath truth. And I had a couple of members of that one church come up along with the pastor and they were furious. They were angry because we're stealing sheep. Why are you taking people from our church? Why don't you go focus on the lost? And it's, and, and I've had one Adventist church say that to another Adventist church. Why are you stealing our people? And part of that goes with, um, you know, for some of these faiths, um, if they lose members, they lose tithe, they lose income. Some of them, their paychecks are tied to this. So, yes, Eunice, their paychecks definitely mm. tied to this. Um, and that can be scary for people. Yeah. Um, so it's it's I, I remember when we came to pastors and we started talking to them about postmodern young people and, and how. Um, things have shifted in culture and how um, people think differently. And a number of pastors were like, I don't know what to do with that. I, 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 we've always had it this way. I don't know if I can adapt to the new approaches or, or the new ways of reaching people. We get used to what we get used to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so these people are so furious with Paul. They're playing the Caesar card and, and they chased them from one city to another, um, they, they chased them some 24 kilometers. Um, uh, I know actually, I think it's 46 kilometers, some 24 miles to Berea to stir up trouble in that city against him. Um, can you imagine somebody being that mad with you? They're willing to chase you uh, mm -hmm. to the other side of Ottawa just to <laughs> poke you? <laughs> I mean, they made you think about this. Imagine somebody making you their personal mission wow. and it isn't for salvation mm. oh, sad. right yeah. wow. and um and yet you know what how is gossip any different mm. okay. isn't gossip making it your personal mission to do it destroy another human being mm -hmm. the reputation the character you know and and oh placid i agree if mm -hmm. only we were so zealous in spreading with the word of god mm -hmm. yeah you know instead of spreading dirty laundry and lies wouldn't yeah. it be great if we just spread the word Jesus. of god yeah you know um so um so uh, so it says uh they're angry because the accusation is imagine this accusation against you it's so powerful uh that 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 you've turned the world upside down like you've turned ottawa on its head um so how in the world did Paul and Silas upset the world, making fun of the Greek religion, mocking the Jewish leaders, breaking the law, preaching the gospel? They preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, why do you think it is that the gospel is so divisive? I mean, think about Jesus' words. I didn't come to bring peace, mm -hmm. but a sword. Mm -hmm. uh and 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 what the you know so i wanted to ask why do you think the gospel is so divisive why is it that it upsets so many people the way it does um placid shifting is not easy sorry go ahead carolyn it's a great controversy 
great controversy. There's a war. Yeah, yeah. I think that people are, are get quite comfortable um, in the seat that they're in, um, especially the seat of sin, because sin is sweet. And mm. from there to leave from there to turn on the side of Jesus, it's um it's not easy, but God's grace is sufficient. So the, the gospel is divisive because it divides truth from error. Okay, absolutely. And if you're in darkness, it's yeah, it shines a bright light. Yeah. Eunice is saying because it is the opposite from our sinful natures and Brother P is saying it's because of our depraved hearts. It attacks our sinful nature in, you know, in agreement here with Eunice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It requires for us to submit our will to God rather than our flesh. And it requires us to be selfless when we want to be selfish. Mm -hmm. Folks, I'm, I, I, I had a list of five things and I'm, I'm hearing this in, in, you know, as I thought about it. Um, you know, the gospel is about Jesus not you, not us. Yeah. You know, we, we live in a world that is obsessed with self. Um, you know, social media made us a little obsessed with us, a little narcissistic, a little, let's focus on me, let's focus on me. Um, and, and so, but this, no, this is about, no, now you have to turn your focus, your attention and your life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And now your life doesn't become defined about by how wonderful we are but by how wonderful Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And again, I was sharing this with the young man today about how baptism, and, and I loved this thought and I was thankful um, God had just helped me understand for myself better mm -hmm. that being born again means I've died to everything that defined me mm -hmm. before I met Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, and what defined me was my sinful nature and my flesh. And yeah, there's no I in Jesus. And mm -hmm. um right? It's, it's, it's literally what now defines me is Jesus. And when you're a Jew and it's your own righteousness that defines mm. you and your good works and my tithe and my eating and my fasting and my grieving in the middle of the street, and now I can't draw attention to me. Mm. Whew, that was heavy. That mm. was, that was a big deal back then. Mm. Now, the other one is it calls out our sin. And, uh, I, I tell you, when you've lived your life thinking you're all that and you're righteous and you're holy, and all of a sudden here's this message that says, now nah, you're spiritually dead. Without Jesus, all that holiness and all that works and, and all your perfect behavior is still filthy rags without Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right? That the ground at the cross is level. Mm -hmm. Nobody is any more holy mm -hmm. and nobody's any more sinful. We're all lost sinners yeah. and so you don't get to claim a special status over other people mm -hmm. which is why we christians say we're not better than you because we're christians mm -hmm. we just happen to have a savior who's better than we are amen and of course it's not you know it, it, it's it's the gospel is about grace not works now why would that be a big deal for the jews because they thought that they that righteousness was by works. <laughs> right? Can you imagine keeping 613 laws perfectly? And right? Right? I I you know, really Jesus got it down to 3 for us when you think about it. Love God with all your heart, mind and soul, you know, everything you are, everything you have. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. And then he really got it down to just love well. Love each other the way I've loved you. Amen. And um and and you know and and I struggle with with those three. Uh, right? <laughs> I still struggle with there are days I just I get this love thing wrong. Um I you know we love ourselves. We 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 love our sometimes our flesh, its cravings and its desires. And 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 to compensate for that we hide behind works. And, you know, and I think sometimes that some of the people who are into perfection are the people who are just trying to cover up the greatest sins and flaws in their life, in their own heart. Mm. You know, that's why Jesus said, you Pharisees, you're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. You act one way, but man, I know your heart. Mm 
Yeah. I know what you're covering up. I know the masks you're wearing. And this is, brings us to the gospel is honest because it doesn't care about our masks. Mm -hmm. It doesn't care about what you're pretending to be. You can, you know, on social media, we can look like we have the perfect life. We can mm -hmm. go to church and act like I've got it all going on. I'm dressing mm -hmm. right. I'm praying right. I'm, you know, I put my hands up at the right times, bring them down. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I say, you know, I, I, I can look the part mm -hmm. um and and we know we know how this works you can be mm -hmm. so messed up on the inside mm -hmm. but you look all good and jesus said you look like these washed bowls you're all mm -hmm. sparkly shiny on the outside but man you are rotten on the inside mm -hmm. and the gospel just cuts through our masks and our fake you know uh, just trying to fake it and it goes no i i god gets down to look i really know who you are Let's deal with that. Let's let's address that person. Let's well, I can't I can't help you be like Jesus if you're not being real about where you're at. And here's the thing. The gospel provides free choice. Every false religion and every cult robs you of a free choice. This is why I argue Adventism is not a cult. Because you still have the free, you can leave the church. You're free to do that. Well, we're not going to hunt you down. We're not going to beat you up. You, you, you can believe a little differently here or there. You can grow in your understanding of things. But in the Jewish faith, you either believed or you were like excommunicated. You could be stoned for certain things. And so the gospel really cuts through our humanity and our false religions and our false sense of self and false secure you know this false sense of security and trust in our own works and it really gets us down to who we really are in light of who jesus is and that can be really upsetting for people mm -hmm. who are who who are using religion um to benefit themselves rather than to benefit others folks moving along can somebody read for us acts 17 7 And Jesus has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Now, I'm going to skip over this next slide, and I'm going to go to this one. Why didn't they want to accept Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah? He was from Nazareth. He had a questionable birth. He was too radical for them. He didn't fit the requirements. D. Yeah, he didn't fit the requirements for sure. I think okay. I, I, I also want to choose A and B because he he was born to Mary. He was born to a human who was Mary and Joseph, who was a widower before he married Mary. Yeah. And and to them he was he was radical. It's probably all of the above. Yeah, I I yeah. Because he was straight on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I I love this. I'm actually studying with uh, one of our uh, one of our teens at our church, and she processes it the same way. Because I I have studies um, geared for teens, right, with this kind of format, and I'll watch her go. Well, it can't be that, and it can't be that, and uh, but Pastor, you said last week, so it can't be that. <laughs> And she starts making, and it's a beautiful thing to see in a young person. I love yeah. studying with her. Um, Eunice is saying it wasn't what they wanted. Um, D equals A plus B plus C. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> and Angela's uh, writing, they expected him to come riding on a white horse. Yeah, um, yeah. Folks. I'm 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 I've actually a uh, placid. I'm gonna copy and paste that one into my yeah, notes. You can tell that placid is a financial person. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, leave leave it leave it leave it to the finance guy just to give us an equation. Mm -hmm. But it's actually um, uh, without realizing it, I I think that in in my mind I might have been kind of thinking the same way because mm -hmm. when you want to reject somebody. You will find every excuse every, in the book. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
right? I mean, like the, he's from Nazareth. We know that was used against Jesus. Do we read that in the book of Acts? I'm not sure, but that stuff carries from place to place. Mm -hmm. um, and they would have heard that. Um, his birth, would they would have questioned that. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, you're right. His preaching was head on. Mm -hmm. And folks, it was radical for its day. Love your enemy. What do you mean love the Romans? <laughs> right? A Roman slaps me on the cheek. Why do you mean I got to give? What do you mean I got to carry his tunic an extra mile? <laughs> Did you? I mean, this stuff's radical. Yeah. Um, it, it For its day, yeah. he was radical. Um, when it came to applying the word of God to your life and what the kingdom of God was all about. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about the Beatitudes, you know, I called it the upside down kingdom of God mm -hmm. because it was so backwards to what they understood the kingdom to be about. Mm -hmm. Now, so, so here we have Paul and Silas and they're in a lot of trouble again. And you know, uh, the, the crowds are stirred up. People are accusing them. They got people chasing them now from city to city. Um, and, and you know, but, and sometimes, you know, I wonder, like, like, Paul, how did you manage? Then I realized he truly believed and he was all in. I mean, this is what mm -hmm. full passionate commitment yeah. for Paul looked like. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes people will offer up Paul's life as an example to us all of how we too need to be all in and fully committed. But I wanted to ask, though, mm -hmm. what does the total commitment to the gospel look like in a person who's not a gifted evangelist or a missionary? I mean, let's face it. We know not everybody is called to be an evangelist or a pastor or a missionary, and we know that for evangelists and missionaries, life can be really hard depending on where you are. So, so we, we look at them, and, and when they suffer persecution or they get um, hurt, right? So, um, so is it you know and understand the mission? You know and use your spiritual gifts. You partner with your church. You share what you know. All of the above. Oh, yeah, I agree with that, too. A absolutely. Look, folks, uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the things um, as I'm going now from church to church where I'm doing workshops, people ask me, like, what's the first thing we need to do as a church to, you know, uh, embrace and, and become, you know, like what Nepean is, is doing? Mm -hmm. And I say, first, you got to have a mission. And if your church has a mission, you really should know, you should know that mission off by heart. You should be right. Um, and, 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 and you should know the mission. You should know what it is your church is aiming to do for the Lord in your community. Uh, you are spiritually gifted. Whether you realize it or not, everybody has been given gifts by the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't used yours or you don't know what it is, and you go to the Holy Spirit and you're committed to finding out and using that gift, you will either be re-gifted or your gift will come back to life. You know, if, you're, if your church is on the move, partner with it. Encourage your church. Invest in it. And folks, when somebody asks, just share what you know. Yeah. You're not asked to share what you don't know. You're not asked to give sermons and lengthy Bible studies. Um, but at Nepean, uh, this fall or winter, we're going to actually do a series on how to share your faith, what a witness looks like, um, how to share your faith, um, how to have a Jesus conversation with people, and what the best conversations are to have mm -hmm. without Bible thumping and beating people over the head, um, like my grandmother used to do. But I'll tell those stories <laughs> later. Um, and yes, Eunice, and everything you do, you do it for the Lord. Amen. Right? Absolutely, you know. Um, so why did the Berean Jews believe Paul so readily? They were gullible, they studied for themselves, they weren't good Jews, they were weak minded. They studied for themselves. The Bible tells us they studied the word. They studied every day they studied. Yep. Right? Paul's preaching on Sabbaths, and they spent the rest of the week studying the sermon. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. Or, you know, it would be like, 
okay, we had a Wednesday night Bible study and, and, and we talked about this. So I'm going to spend the rest of the week just making sure that what we talked about, it's actually in the Bible. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Or, or you hear a sermon and it's like, um, you know, and, and, and it's touching when somebody says, you know, pastor, the sermon moved me. Mm-hmm. Um, what I have fun with are the people who come up to me or later in the week and go, well, pastor, but what about this? Or what about that? And um, I even had uh, this young person I'm studying with go, but pastor, you said, so how does that match this? And I would go, I got to go back and look at that. And it, and it was a unique connection. Like, like she drew a very unique connection I hadn't seen. And I'm like, I got to go back now and study the word. Mm-hmm. Um, because you saw this from an angle I hadn't considered before. And I went, oh, wow, the Holy Spirit's moving on that young heart. Mm-hmm. But she just didn't take it for granted. We have got to, I mean, being a people of the word, mm-hmm. I mean, when was the last time you hauled out, let's just say something heavy, like the pre-advent judgment and said, do I really, like, do I understand it? Um, if I had to explain it to a child, could I do it? Uh, what, what, the, you know, when was the last time you, you dusted off what we believe? Now, by the way, we are going to go over the 28 fundamental beliefs. Um, the elders are going to take um, us through uh, in our encounter Bible study, uh, um, the 28 fundamental beliefs. And we're going to kind of look at them from the angle of, some of the objections we get to what we believe. So what is it we believe? What are some of the common uh, objections? How do we share our faith? So that's coming up, actually. Um, So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Angela is saying, these Jews did not have closed minds, Mm -hmm. and they received the word with all readiness. In other words, they wanted to know the truth, Mm -hmm. right? They didn't want to be Jews. They wanted to be the Jews who truly understood the word of God. And so, uh, again, Angela, I think you would find comfort in this, that agreement. And it's verse 11. And the people of Berea were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica. And they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. truth. Mm -hmm. And so, folks, really a truth worth sharing. Because yeah. Jesus knows the real you, the person hiding behind the mask, mm-hmm. and he loves you. Mm-hmm. Jesus wants you to take off the mask because the real Jesus loves the real you. Mm-hmm. The pretend want to be you, but the real you, scars and all. Amen. And folks, Amen. And folks Paul's testimony mm-hmm. included saying, listen, this is who I was before Jesus. No masks. Here's my scars. Mm-hmm. Here's... Here's who I was. Mm-hmm. And, and when Jesus moved past that person, mm-hmm. it's not about Paul, the Pharisee anymore. It's just about Paul, the bondservant of Jesus. And if you live from this perspective, take off the mask and let the real Jesus love the real you. Mm-hmm. And then let that gospel transform your life. Mm-hmm. You'll find yourself changing the world. Folks, that was our study for this evening. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, again, as always, we like to close out with um, prayer requests. So just give me a second here. I just need to change this over here. I thought I'd already, I thought I had been prepared and had a pen set aside. Here we go. Folks, any prayer requests tonight? Well, I have a phrase. Right on. I'm yes. Very, I'm very thankful that... Um... We had, we had car trouble last week and someone went out of his way, went the extra mile because he was going off duty and he ran out to find someone who was on break to at least look at our car so that we could drive it home because I had said Albert had just had surgery. So I, I'm yes. thankful for that gentleman that he, he did oh, go wow. the extra mile. And then we had trouble yesterday with the car and, 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 and it was a little boy who, who was, um, it was at Tim Hortons actually, and a little boy was going through with his father on the drive through and he pointed to his father with the hood that was up on her car. And when they were coming around after and leaving, the father said, do you, are you in trouble? You, do you need any help? And I said, 
we called CAA, but I said, you are the good Samaritan. That's what you <laughs> said. <laughs> amen. Amen. Um, anybody else? Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, I, ju I just want to share. Um, so last week when we went out to distribute literature, um, mm -hmm. as soon as we turned into a street, we encountered a skunk. Oh no. Uh -oh. Uh, and I'm like, I stand there and I'm I'm frozen and I'm like, oh, don't spray me, don't spray me, please. <laughs> so I just slowly backed up and walk away, went all the way around the other street. <laughs> then when we got around the other street, we met this really nice gentleman who came out and uh, mm. saying that we're doing really wonderful work. He took her book. Mm -hmm. He was he studying law, mm -hmm. by the way. So pray for him. His name is Eric, and Eric is studying law. But um, as soon as he's finished, he's going to be writing his bar. He's going to be reading the great controversy. Mm -hmm. So yes, just want to okay. share that. Yeah. The Holy Amen. Spirit directed you to him. Yes, yes. But <laughs> the enemy wanted to stop me going. So we had to go the other way around all the way. Right. We didn't give up. <laughs> the Holy Spirit go ye this way. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Upcoming for and fast and Sabbath, God's willing. The distribution, I, the distribution to the community. Sir, we were thinking the same thing. Got it down. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um. Also, let's add the um, the conference is coming to, to Nepean to host a young adult weekend yes. for young adult leaders, and I just want to pray God's blessing on them and. Pastor Hong's going to be speaking at Nepean this Sabbath. And I want to just, you know, always praying for young adults. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the young adult Sabbath on spiritual gifts. Like, wow, like yeah. what a like wow. great yeah. insight, honest, heartfelt yeah. sharing. Yeah. Loved it. Um, folks, I also have a praise. When I was at the um, Earth Summit, um, I was doing a, a workshop. Uh, in regards to intelligent design and how there are things in nature that point to a designer. So trying to make this quick, there was a 19 year old girl there. She was all in, followed the whole 30 minute talk. Uh, afterwards, she asked me a couple of questions and then she said to me, look, I'm 19 years of age. I left my faith. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm finding it hard to connect to God. And can you share with me why it is that Christianity, out of all the religions, as she said, I'm searching. Um, she said, I'm, I'm losing my faith. Why is, does Christianity stand out amongst all the other religions? Why, why this one? And she happened to be wearing a little cross. And I said, because of that little emblem right there around your neck. Amen. I said, you, 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 you ask any other religion, how are you saved? Mm -hmm. And not a single one of them has a God who did for you what your God did on that right there. She nearly died. Oh, All we had, wow. we, like, I was supposed to have another workshop. And the people who were with me as a part of my team were like, this is more important. Like, this is what we're here for. This is a, this is a divine encounter. We're stopping everything. We, we, we want to intercede in this young lady's life. Mm -hmm. And, and I tell you, it was a moment you live for. So I praise God Amen. that that for those moments when, like Angela, you run into people and you have a Jesus conversation. Yes. yes. Um, also, um, Eunice is asking us to pray for her nieces, uh, Caroline and Jacqueline. And uh, Bianca. And I also understand your sister's home. We're happy about that. Safe and sound. Um, praising God. That good. I was, I was so happy to hear that Eliana is back. Folks, any other requests or praises? If not, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. And, and let's close with prayer. Oh, Father God in heaven, Lord, we have so much to praise you for. Amen. First of all, the salvation about mm -hmm. moving, Lord, touching us in a way that we could hear the truth, be convicted by it, converted mm -hmm. by it, 
And 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 now here we are, Lord, your family. You've made us sons and daughters. And I pray that like Paul and, and Silas, that Lord, you would again just reignite in us a desire to be fully committed to you, mm. to bring glory to you in everything we do, and to, to partner with the Holy Spirit and our church family in sharing the gospel. Because Lord, we know once the gospel's gone and everybody's made their decision. We wrap it up and we go home. And so I pray, Lord, that we would have a passion for finishing the work. And so tonight we have praises. You know, Lord, those moments when we're in need and, and somebody just out of the blue is right there and you provide strangers in times when we need help. Or, Lord, we're going in one direction and maybe you put uh, something stinky in our path so that you redirect us so we can have divine encounters. And we thank you for divine encounters, for those moments when we encounters, we just didn't see it coming. And we're now talking about Jesus and mm -hmm. you just provide us with the right thing to say in the right moment, mm -hmm. providing us the words in the moment of need. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for those moments. And again, for just all, all those times when we pray mm -hmm. and then Lord, you you provide and we pray for divine encounters and uh, lord for opportunities to just share how you move past our masks and and you redeemed us you saw our need and and lord you healed broken hearts and restored lives we we have things coming up lord speaking of um your work and, and your church and the family um prayer and fasting is taking place this sabbath um at nepean and as always lord we want the worship and the prayer and fasting to draw people to Jesus, to help them grow in their relationship with Christ. And while at the same time, Lord, connecting with you, we want intimacy with you. And so I, I pray a blessing on Pastor Hong as he preaches at Nepean this Sabbath, that he has a word from your altar for us that draws us to Christ. And then as we move into prayer and fasting, Lord, we are drawn into deeper intimacy with Jesus. Um, we, we pray for the food drive that's going to take place because there are people in need. And Lord, people are hungry and, and so many Canadians are struggling right now. And so we want to do what we can, Lord, to share your love with those who are in need. And also praying for the upcoming Chio um, bike event. Uh, we have a number of our members who are engaged in that. We pray that it would be the blessing that Chio needs to provide medical care and service to people in our community. And Lord, we also pray for our friends, members of our church family who struggle. And there are multiple struggles. And God, you have answers. You have resources. You love us. And, and we're praying that God, you would be meet all of our needs, all of the needs in Christ Jesus that we have. Mm. And now as we go our separate ways here, I pray that Lord, you would ever draw us to you. Bless the, the folks that come out, Lord, tonight and our church families and those we love. Lord, bless, be poured out. And again, cause us to get into the word, to see the truth of who Jesus is. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank well, you. thank you everybody for coming out and joining us. God bless. And uh, looking forward to seeing you next week. Take Thanks. care. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.